The Pickwick Papers, Chapter Twenty Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens, Chapter Twenty Three, in which Mr. Samuel Weller begins to devote his energies to the return match between himself and Mr. Trotter. In a small room in the vicinity of the stable-yard, betimes in the morning, which were ushered in by Mr. Pickwick's adventure with a middle-aged lady in the yellow curl-papers, sat Mr. Weller, senior, preparing himself for his journey to London. He was sitting in an excellent attitude for having his portrait taken, and here it is. It is very possible that at some earlier period in his career Mr. Weller's profile might have presented a bold and determined outline his face however had expanded under the influence of good living and a disposition remarkable for resignation and its bold fleshy curves had so far extended beyond the limits originally assigned them that unless you took a full view of his countenance in front it was difficult to distinguish more than the extreme tip of a very rubicund nose his chin from the same cause had acquired the grave and imposing form which is generally described by prefixing the word double to that expressive feature and his complexion exhibited that peculiarly mottled combination of colours which is only to be seen in gentlemen of his profession and in underdone roast beef round his neck he wore a crimson travelling shawl which merged into his chin by such imperceptible gradations that it was difficult to distinguish the folds of the one from the folds of the other over this he mounted a long waistcoat of a broad pink-striped pattern and over that again a wide-skirted green coat ornamented with large brass buttons whereof the two which garnished the waist were so far apart that no man had ever beheld them both at the same time his hair which was short sleek and black was just visible beneath the capacious brim of a low-crowned brown hat his legs were encased in knee-cord breeches and painted top-boots and a copper watch-chain terminating in one seal and a key of the same material dangled loosely from his capacious waistband we have said that mr weller was engaged in preparing for his journey to london he was taking sustenance in fact on the table before him stood a pot of ale a cold round of beef and a very respectable looking loaf to each of which he distributed his favours in turn with the most rigid impartiality he had just cut a mighty slice from the latter when the footsteps of somebody entering the room caused him to raise his head and he beheld his son "'Morning, Sammy,' said the father. The son walked up to the pot of ale, and, nodding significantly to his parent, took a long draught by way of reply. "'Wery good pour o' suction, Sammy,' said Mr. Weller the elder, looking into the pot when his firstborn had set it down half empty. "'You'd a made an uncommon fine oyster, Sammy, if you'd been born in that station o' life.' "'Yes, I dare say I should have managed to pick up a respectable livin', replied Sam, applying himself to the cold beef with considerable vigour. "'I'm wery sorry, Sammy,' said the elder Mr. Weller, shaking up the ale by describing small circles with the pot, preparatory to drinking. "'I'm wery sorry, Sammy, to hear from your lips as you let yourself be gammoned by that ere mulberry man. I always thought, up to three days ago, that the names of Veller and Gammon could never have come into contract, Sammy. Never. Always accepted the case of a widder, of course, said Sam. Widders, Sammy, replied Mr. Weller, slightly changing colour. Widders are exceptions to every rule. I have heard how many ordinary women one widder's equal to in pint of comin over you. I think it's five and twenty, but I don't rightly know whether it ain't more. "'Well, that's pretty well,' said Sam. "'Besides,' continued Mr. Weller, not noticing the interruption, "'that's a worry different thing. "'You know what the council said, Sammy, "'as defended the gentleman as beat his wife with the poker "'and every got jolly? "'And after all, my lord,' says he, "'it's an amiable weakness. "'So I says respect and widders, Sammy, "'and so you'll save and you gets as old as me. "'I ought to have known better, I know,' said Sam. "'Ought to a known better,' repeated Mr. Weller, striking the table with his fist. "'Ought to a known better. Why, I know a young un as hasn't had half nor quarter your edication, as hasn't slept about the markets, no, not six months, who'd a scorned to be let in in such a vey. Scorned it, Sammy.' 
In the excitement of feeling produced by this agonizing reflection, Mr. Weller rang the bell and ordered an additional pint of ale. "'Well, it's no use talking about it now,' said Sam. "'It's over and can't be helped, and that's one consolation, as they always say in Turkey when they cuts the wrong man's head off. It's my innings now, Governor, and as soon as I catches hold of this here trotter, I'll have a good un.' "'I hope you will, Sammy, I hope you will,' returned Mr. Weller. "'Here's your health, Sammy, and may you speedily wipe off the disgrace as you've inflicted on the family name.' In honour of this toast, Mr. Weller imbibed at a draught at least two-thirds of a newly arrived pint, and handed it over to his son to dispose of the remainder, which he instantaneously did. "'And now, Sammy,' said Mr. Weller, consulting a large double-faced silver watch that hung at the end of the copper chain, "'now it's time I was up at the office to get my vay bill and see the coach loaded. For coaches, Sammy, is like guns. They requires to be loaded with very great care afore they go off.' At this parental and professional joke, Mr. Weller, Jr., smiled a filial smile. His revered parent continued in a solemn tone. I'm a going to leave you, Sm uh, I'm a going to leave you, Samuel, my boy, and there's no telling when I shall see you again. Your mother-in-law may have been too much for me, or a thousand things may have happened by the time you next hears any news of the celebrated Mister Veller of the Bell Savage. The family name depends very much upon you, Samuel, and I hope you'll do what's right by it. Upon all little pints of breeding, I know I may trust you as well as if it was my own self. "'So I've only this here one bit of advice to give you. "'If ever you gets to upwards of fifty, "'and feels disposed to go a-marryin' anybody, no matter who, "'just you shut yourself up in your own room, if you've got one, "'and pison yourself off-hand. "'Hangin's welger, so don't you have nothing to say to that. "'Pison yourself, Samuel, my boy, pison yourself, "'and you'll be glad on it afterwards.' "'With these affecting words, Mr. Weller looked steadfastly on his son, and turning slowly upon his heel, disappeared from his sight. In the contemplative mood which these words had awakened, Mr. Samuel Weller walked forth from the great white horse where his father had left him, and bending his steps toward St. Clement's Church, endeavoured to dissipate his melancholy by strolling among its ancient precincts. He had loitered about for some time when he found himself in a retired spot, a kind of courtyard of venerable appearance, which he discovered had no other outlet than the turning by which he had entered. He was about retracing his steps, when he was suddenly transfixed to the spot by a sudden appearance, and the mode and manner of this appearance we now proceed to relate. Mr. Samuel Weller had been staring up at the old brick houses now and then, in his deep abstraction, bestowing a wink upon some healthy-looking servant-girl as she drew up a blind or threw open a bedroom window, when the green gate of a garden at the bottom of the yard opened, and a man having emerged therefrom, closed the green gate very carefully after him, and walked briskly towards the very spot where Mr. Weller was standing. Now taking this as an isolated fact, unaccompanied by any attendant circumstances, there was nothing very extraordinary in it, because in many parts of the world men do come out of gardens, close green gates after them, and even walk briskly away without attracting any particular share of public observation. It is clear, therefore, that there must have been something in the man or in his manner or both to attract Mr. Weller's particular notice. Whether there was or not, we must leave the reader to determine, when we have faithfully recorded the behaviour of the individual in question. When the man had shut the green gate after him, he walked, as we have said twice already, with a brisk pace up the courtyard. But he no sooner caught sight of Mr. Weller than he faltered and stopped as if uncertain for the moment what course to adopt. As the green gate was closed behind him, and there was no other outlet but the one in front, however, he was not long in perceiving that he must pass Mr. Samuel Weller to get away. He therefore resumed his brisk pace, and advanced staring straight before him. The most extraordinary thing about the man was, that he was contorting his face into the most fearful and astonishing grimaces that ever were beheld. Nature's handiwork never was disguised with such extraordinary artificial carving as the man had overlaid his countenance with in one moment. "'Well,' said Mr. Weller to himself, as the man approached, "'this is very odd. I could have swore it was him.' Up came the man, 
and his face became more frightfully distorted than ever as he drew nearer. "'I could take my very oath to that ere black hair and mulberry suit,' said Mr. Weller. "'Only I never seen such a face as that afore.' As Mr. Weller said this, the man's features assumed an unearthly twinge, perfectly hideous. He was obliged to pass very near Sam, however, and the scrutinizing glance of that gentleman enabled him to detect, under all these appalling twists of fortune, something too like the small eyes of Mr. Job Trotter to be easily mistaken. "'Hullo, you, sir!' shouted Sam fiercely. The stranger stopped. "Hullo," repeated Sam, still more gruffly. The man with the horrible face looked with the greatest surprise up the court and down the court, and in at the windows of the houses, everywhere but at Sam Weller, and took another step forward when he was brought to again by another shout. "'Hallo, you, sir!' said Sam, for the third time. There was no pretending to mistake where the voice came from now, so the stranger, having no other resource, at last looked Sam Weller full in the face. "'It won't do, Job Trotter,' said Sam. "'Come, none of that air nonsense. "'You ain't so wary handsome that you can't afford to throw away many of your good looks. "'Bring them air eyes of yourn back into their proper places, "'or I'll knock em out of your head, do you hear?' As Mr. Weller appeared fully disposed to act up to the spirit of this address, Mr. Trotter gradually allowed his face to resume its natural expression, and then, giving a start of joy, exclaimed, "'What do I see? Mr. Walker!' "'Ah!' replied Sam. "'You're very glad to see me, ain't you?' "'Glad!' exclaimed Job Trotter. "'Oh, Mr. Walker, if you had but known how I have looked forward to this meeting! It is too much, Mr. Walker. I cannot bear it. Indeed, I cannot!' And with these words Mr. Trotter burst into a regular inundation of tears, and, flinging his arms around those of Mr. Weller, embraced him closely in an ecstasy of joy. "'Get off!' cried Sam, indignant at this process, and vainly endeavouring to extricate himself from the grasp of his enthusiastic acquaintance. "'Get off, I tell you! What are you crying over me for, you portable engine?' "'Because I'm so glad to see you,' replied Job Trotter, gradually releasing Mr. Weller as the first symptoms of his pugnacity disappeared. "'Oh, Mr. Walker, this is too much!' "'Too much?' echoed Sam. "'I think it is too much, rather. "'Now, what have you got to say to me, eh?' Mr. Trotter made no reply, for the little pink pocket-handkerchief was in full force. "'What have you got to say to me afore I knock your head off?' repeated Mr. Weller, in a threatening manner. "'Eh?' said Mr. Trotter, with a look of virtuous surprise. "'What have you got to say to me?' "'I, Mr. Walker? Don't call me Walker. My name's Veller. You know that well enough. What have you got to say to me?' "'Bless you, Mr. Walker. Weller, I mean. A great many things, if you will come away somewhere where we can talk comfortably. If you knew how I have looked for you, Mr. Weller.' "'Wery hard indeed, I suppose,' said Sam, dryly. "'Very, very, sir,' replied Mr. Trotter, without moving a muscle of his face. "'But shake hands, Mr. Weller.' Sam eyed his companion for a few seconds, and then, as if actuated by a sudden impulse, complied with his request. "'How?' said Job Trotter, as they walked away. "'How is your dear good master? Oh, he is a worthy gentleman, Mr. Weller. I hope he didn't catch cold that dreadful night, sir.' There was a momentary look of deep slyness in Job Trotter's eye as he said this, which ran a thrill through Mr. Weller's clenched fist as he burned with a desire to make a demonstration on his ribs. Sam constrained himself, however, and replied that his master was extremely well. "'Oh, I am so glad,' replied Mr. Trotter. "'Is he here?' "'Is yourn?' asked Sam, by way of reply. "'Oh, yes, he is here, and I grieve to say, Mr. Weller, he is going on worse than ever.' "'Ah, ah!' said Sam. "'Oh, shocking, terrible!' "'At a boarding-school?' said Sam. "'No, not at a boarding-school,' replied Job Trotter, with the same sly look which Sam had noticed before. "'Not at a boarding-school.' "'At the house with the green gate?' said Sam, eyeing his companion closely. "'No, no, oh, not there,' replied Job, with a quickness very unusual to him. "'Not there.' "'What was you a-doin' there?' asked Sam, with a sharp glance. "'Got inside the gate by accident, perhaps?' "'Why, Mr. Weller,' replied Job, "'I don't mind telling you my little secrets, because, you know, we took such a fancy for each other when we first met. You recollect how pleasant we were that morning?' "'Oh, yes,' said Sam impatiently. "'I remember. Well?' 
"'Well,' replied Job, speaking with great precision, and in the low tone of a man who communicates an important secret, "'in that house with the green gate, Mr. Weller, they keep a good many servants.' "'So I should think, by the look on it,' interposed Sam. "'Yes,' continued Mr. Trotter, "'and one of them is a cook, who has saved up a little money, Mr. Weller, and is desirous, if she can establish herself in life, to open a little shop in the chandlery way, you see.' "'Yes?' "'Yes, Mr. Weller. Well, sir, I met her at a chapel that I go to, a very neat little chapel in this town, Mr. Weller, where they sing the number four collection of hymns, which I generally carry about with me in a little book, which you may perhaps have seen in my hand. And I got a little intimate with her, Mr. Weller, and from that an acquaintance sprung up between us, and I may venture to say, Mr. Weller, that I am to be the chandler.' "'Ah, and a very amiable chandler you'll make,' replied Sam, eyeing Job with a side look of intense dislike. "'The great advantage of this, Mr. Weller,' continued Job, his eyes filling with tears as he spoke, "'will be that I shall be able to leave my present disgraceful service with that bad man, and to devote myself to a better and more virtuous life, more like the way in which I was brought up, Mr. Weller.' "'You might have been very nicely brought up,' said Sam. "'Oh, very, Mr. Weller, very,' replied Job. At the recollection of the purity of his youthful days, Mr. Trotter pulled forth the pink handkerchief and wept copiously. "'You might have been an uncommon nice boy to go to school with,' said Sam. "'I was, sir,' replied Job, heaving a deep sigh. "'I was the idol of the place.' "'Ah,' said Sam, "'I don't wonder at it. What a comfort you must have been to your blessed mother.' At these words Mr. Job Trotter inserted an end of the pink handkerchief into the corner of each eye, one after the other, and began to weep copiously. "'What's the matter with the man?' said Sam, indignantly. "'Chelsea Waterworks is nothing to you. What are you melting with now? The consciousness of willany?' "'I cannot keep my feelings down, Mr. Weller,' said Job, after a short pause. "'To think that my master should have suspected the conversation I had with yours, and so dragged me away in a post-chaise, and after persuading the sweet young lady to say she knew nothing of him, and bribing the schoolmistress to do the same, deserted her for a better speculation. Oh, Mr. Weller, it makes me shudder!' "'Oh, that was the vey, was it?' said Mr. Weller. "'To be sure it was,' replied Job. "'Well,' said Sam, as they had now arrived near the hotel, "'I want to have a little bit of talk with you, Job, sir, if you're not particular engaged. I should like to see you at the Great White Horse to-night, somewheres about eight o'clock.' "'I shall be sure to come,' said Job. "'Yes, you'd better,' replied Sam, with a very meaning look, "'or else I shall perhaps be asking after you, at the other side of the green gate, that I might cut you out, you know.' "'I shall be sure to be with you, sir,' said Mr. Trotter, and, wringing Sam's hand with the utmost fervour, he walked away. "'Take care, Job Trotter, take care,' said Sam, looking after him, "'or I shall be one too many for you this time, I shall indeed.' Having uttered this soliloquy, and looked after Job till he was to be seen no more, Mr. Weller made the best of his way to his master's bedroom. "'It's all in training, sir,' said Sam. "'What's in training, Sam?' inquired Mr. Pickwick. "'I've found him out, sir,' said Sam. "'Found out who? "'That ere queer customer and the melancholy chap with the black hair.' "'Impossible, Sam,' said Mr. Pickwick, with the greatest energy. "'Where are they, Sam? "'Where are they?' "'Hush, hush,' replied Mr. Weller, as he assisted Mr. Pickwick to dress. "'He detailed the plan of action on which he proposed to enter. "'But when is this to be done, Sam?' inquired Mr. Pickwick. "'All in good time, sir,' replied Sam. "'Whether it was done in good time or not will be seen hereafter.'" End of chapter 23